going to talk to you. This is week four. Week four. Get up and get dressed. How many of you have got something out of this series that I've been doing on get up and get dressed? Yeah, I hope you have because it, you need to grow in the Lord. We, everybody needs to grow in the Lord. Uh, when our children are born, we take them to what we call their checkups. And one of the bragging points about our children when we take them to the checkups is that they've advanced. You know, their, their uh, weight has increased. Now, some of us, it needed to quit increasing over the years. <laughs> but their weight increases. They're, they say, oh, they're in the they're percentile. They're in the height percentile or they're in the weight percentile or blah, blah, whatever the percentiles are we want them in that that range of growth because if they're not growing there's an issue there's a medical issue if babies don't grow now let me just go ahead and push this out over the edge for you if Christians aren't growing there's a spiritual issue you, you should be growing in the Lord every day. Every day you should be growing in the Lord. Some days are better than others. It's just like us. Some days we eat healthier than others, right? You ever walked into a restaurant and said, I just feel like a salad today. And when you walked out, you felt like you had lost 10 pounds because you ate one salad, right? But then there's other days that you ain't leaving until you have three desserts. So you, you're still growing. <laughs> but you're not growing like you ought to. <laughs> and so I want you to understand that the preaching and teaching of the gospel that's done on Sunday morning and Wednesday night and any other time you can be taught the word of God and hear the word of God, it's nourishment for your spiritual growth. This, this is not a time, church is not a time set aside so that, so that we can just see each other. It's great. I mean, I believe there's power in numbers. Uh, I believe there's strength and unity. I, I know that for a fact. And, and so when, when we come together and sing the songs, yeah, it's for worship. But worship is a time to prepare us even more for the Word. Word is vitally important. It's not just somebody getting up and talking to you. One little boy told me one time, he said, or asked me, he said, Pastor Bud, why, why do you scream at everybody? So I'm not screaming at them, I'm screaming for them. I just, I get excited, you know. And, uh, and no, it was not Bobo that time. He keeps me on my toes. But, um, you know, the Word is important. We need the Word. We need the Word. Uh, you, the Bible tells, Jesus said, told the, the devil, he said, man cannot live by bread alone. You know, if all you do is go home and eat bread, your body's going to be physically malnourished and malnutritioned. And so we, we have to understand that, that spiritually we have to grow. Without spiritual growth, something's spiritually wrong. So let me recap and we'll get into the message this morning, week four of Get Up and Get Dressed. Number one, remember this, the first week of it was many Christians don't realize there's a war. Many people don't realize there's a spiritual war going on. Number two was this, that Satan is after every person, every home, and every church. He wants to destroy you. Clay and Jojo, Tyler and Cameron, listen very carefully to what I'm fixing to say to you especially. The moment you say that my marriage is dedicated to God is the moment that Satan wants to rip it apart. Let's do nothing but destroy the home. Wants to destroy. If you've been married 10 years or longer, you've been married 30 minutes or longer, you better understand that Satan wants to destroy your home. And he wants to destroy the Lord's church, Christian churches. Number three was this, that we gotta identify the enemy. We gotta know who the enemy is. The enemy is not another human. This is a spiritual war. You can't fight a spiritual war physically, right? How many of you understand that the days of hand-to-hand -hand combat in, in war between nations is almost a thing of the past? Now it's all electronics. Now it's all about uh, computers and satellites and those types of things. So we got to be able to identify the enemy. Then we talked about the belt of truth. That's knowing the truth 
and also living the truth. And we talked about the body, body armor of God's righteousness. It means it's an armor that protects the vital organs, especially the heart. So we, we talked about that. Then last week we talked about the shoes. But the main thing I wanted you to get out of the shoes, what it is, it was not a covering of the feet. It was not a style. It was not to look a certain way. It was the bottom of the sole that meant the most. The bottom of the shoe that meant the most where the spikes were so that quick movement could be made and terrain that was rough could be, uh, be covered and, and moved on. So it was not made for, uh, or it was made for movement, not the covering of the top of the foot. Then last week we also talked about the shield. It's the one piece of the armor that's not attached to the body, but very vital and very important. So we talked about that. And in this week, this week we're talking about the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Ephesians chapter six, verse 17 says this, put on salvation as your helmet. Put on salvation as your helmet. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity that you've given us to come back together as a body of believers. God, in this house right now, and for those that are listening online this morning, whether it's live or maybe it's, they'll hear it later when it's been recorded. God, they're in a battle. They're fighting a battle. And that battle is treacherous. That battle is dangerous. And that battle is ongoing. God, help every one of us, every one of us, as we begin to explore more of the Word of God, to realize that you give us the ability to suit up in this armor every day. And God, we can put on this armor, and not only can we put on this armor, we will go out to war. And when we go out to war, God, you say if we wear your armor, we can win the battles that we have to fight. So God, I pray that you encourage your church, encourage your people. Let us not see this as anything but a call to victory for the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You know, the, the, the one purpose of a helmet, and you've seen many different styles of helmets before, is to protect the one organ of the body that produces thinking and body control. Controls thinking and body control. There, there are some who think, and, and, and I know there may be some others that don't, but there are some who think that when they get saved, that all their troubles are gone and all of a sudden it's easy street and, and everything is good and everything is grand and everything is glorious and we just, you know, just kind of like sit back and coast. Well, I finally got saved. I surrendered to Christ. I surrendered to the Lord and, and now I'm a Christian so I just sit back and coast through life. I sit back and coast uh, in my relationship with the Lord and so it's gonna be pretty easy. But nothing, listen to me, nothing could be further from the truth. Absolutely nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, listen to me. If nobody was saved, Satan wouldn't need to attack anyone. If nobody was saved, Satan would have no need to use his deceptive ways and his, his attack modes and methods to get to anybody because he would have everybody. But the truth of the matter is, saved people fight a battle. So it's reasonable to understand that Satan attacks believers. Don't ever think that, that well, now that I'm saved, that, that Satan can't touch me. I, I get really, really aggravated. I don't watch them and once they say it or, or print it, I don't listen to much of anything, if anything at all that they say. But it's to hear a teacher or a preacher of the gospel tell them, tell Christian people that they can walk around and, and tell God and Satan what has to be done and, and they're gonna get it done. You know, you've heard it mostly talked about when they, when they say something about uh, name it, claim it, hang it, and frame it. That's one of the, the ideologies, if you will, of, of some of these people that talk about, well, you, Jesus said you could have it, so if you say it in the name of Jesus, you ask whatever you will in Jesus' name and you'll have it, and so you just get it. So I want a brand new whatever, and the next day it just pops out of thin air like some magician. God's not your bellhop. 
You don't just bing, bing, bing on a little bell and God jumps up from behind the counter and says, how can I help you today? That's not the way God works. And you better believe that Satan's not gonna lay down just because somebody gave their heart to Christ and say, I might as well give up and leave them alone. They're done, they belong to God. It's not going to happen. It's very reasonable to understand and realize that Satan attacks believers. Remember the word of God says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And one person said, and it's very true, it doesn't say the weapon won't be formed. It will be formed, it just says the weapon won't prosper. So you gotta understand that. So please understand, salvation isn't, isn't only the key to eternal victory that we will have when we leave this earth, but it's also the key to earthly victory. Salvation is a victory call that gives us a future. It gives us a destination, not only physically, but spiritually, but not only spiritually, but physically. So I want you to picture this helmet of salvation. I want you to get a, a mindset of this, this helmet of salvation that, that we put on, that he says in the word we should put on. And I want you to write these things down this morning. It's very important. Number one about this helmet as you picture it, it personifies or it's personified in Jesus Christ. It's personified in Jesus Christ. To personify means to represent or have the personality qualities, thoughts, or movements of a living being. Well, if this personification happens in Jesus Christ, then we have all of those things in that definition in Christ. This helmet shows that Christ has a desire for his people. He has a desire for his church. He has a desire for his followers to equip us, not with A, but with his purpose not with a plan, but his plan, not with some thoughts, but his thoughts, not with a portion of truth, but with all of his truth, not with a revelation that came from somewhere out of space, but a revelation and a victory that is his revelation and his victory. But why would he need to do that or why would he de even desire to do that in our lives? And here's the reason why, because he knows that the battle that we face is inevitable. You're not going to avoid the battle. Let me say that again, in case you didn't hear me. You are not going to avoid the battle. The battle is going to happen. The battle is coming. It's going to take place. In fact, let me rephrase that. It is taking place in your everyday life. There is not a moment that goes by that the enemy is not scheming to destroy you if you are a born again believer in Jesus Christ. But not only does he know that the battle is inevitable, he knows how to defeat the enemy because he's done it. He done it on Calvary. He done it before he went to Calvary for 40 days or after his 40 days and 40 night fast when the enemy took him and tempted him in all kind of different ways. He knows how to defeat the enemy. He also knows if we're gonna win this battle, if you and I are gonna win this battle, we gotta do it the way he did it. You don't get to do it on your terms. You don't get to do it the way you wanna do it. You gotta do it the way he did it. When I get to stand on the sidelines of the football team in Sly County, uh, I, I watch these coaches very carefully. And I, I, I watch their body language, I listen to what they say, I listen to how they act. And there are times on the, on the side of the field, if the coach gets on the field or too close to the line, the referee can throw a flag on them and they get penalties because they're, they're, they're on the field. And, and the referee sometimes will look at us and say, back up coach, back up. And we'll just reach over and grab the other coach by the shirt and we'll say, hey coach, back up. And they don't even question it, they just back up because they know they're too far out there. And so they, listen, here, here's what I want you to understand. There's guidelines and there's directions and there's, 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 there's abilities that God gives us to fight this battle. Now, when we're talking about defeating the enemy, we've gotta understand that if somebody else has done it 
and somebody else has knowledge of it and somebody else knows how to accomplish that particular goal and that particular uh, feat in their life, then we've got to look at them and pattern ourselves after them. I don't want somebody that has zero dollars in the bank telling me how to become a millionaire. I don't want anybody that has uh, lost their driver's license teaching my kids how to drive. Hint, hint. I, I don't want anybody. Uh, one, one guy said the other day, <clears throat> he said, a pastor said that he, he got this book in the mail and said, uh, uh, a sure way, I believe the title was A Sure Way or How to Pastor a Church During a Pandemic. And he started reading the book. And it dawned on him. None of us have ever pastored a church during a pandemic. We don't know how to do it. So how's he writing a book telling us how to do something he's never done? He said, I closed the book, put it up, and I'll never read it. He said, the reason is because I want to talk to somebody that's taken me somewhere because they know how they got there. You understand what I'm saying? If you're with me, say amen. amen. So if we're going to win this battle, we got to do it the way Jesus did it because Jesus has won the battle. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24 through 31. But to, those, <clears throat> but to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things that counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring nothing what the world considers, or to nothing what the world considers important. Now watch this, as a result, listen, anytime you are in a fight, you want a result. Anytime you're in a battle, you want a result. So listen very carefully to what he said. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. You can't boast about what you've done if you're fighting a battle based on what he did. You got to boast on the one that showed you how to do it because he gave you the ability to learn what he wanted you to do and how he wanted you to do it. And guess what happens in that is putting on this helmet, the thinker, putting on the thinking mechanism or the covering of the thinking me mechanism. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scripture says, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Don't boast about you, boast about the Lord because it's him, it's he the one, he's the one that's given us the, the ability to follow after what he's given us. Number two, write this down. It is a prerequisite, the helmet is a prerequisite to produce ministry. Well, that knocks me out, pastor, I'm not called into the ministry. Well, if you're saved, you are a gospel carrying individual. If you're born again, if you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and, and He's the Lord of your life and, and you believe that God has, has saved you and forgiven you of your sins, you are in ministry or you should be active in ministry. In other words, when, it said, when I say here that it's a prerequisite to produce ministry, this helmet is not optional, it's a requirement. You must have it. If you go for a job interview and, and somebody says to you, uh, well, the, the prerequisite is you have a four-year college degree. If you don't have a four-year college degree, guess what you also don't have? That job, right? It's something you must have. It's something you must take with you. It's something you must carry. It's something you must put on. It's a requirement. This helmet is not optional. It's a requirement. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says, who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things for we have the mind of Christ. For we have the mind of Christ. In football, if a player uh, loses his helmet during the middle of a play, if that helmet comes off, it's automatic that he has to set out one play. Now, some of you in here that played football or are playing football, you know what I'm talking about. If that helmet comes off, then he has to set out one play. I don't know why they made that rule. Uh, I'm sure it's a safety issue. But the rule is if his helmet comes off in a play, he has to set out that one play. He can return after one play. If he'll just set out one play, then yes, he can come back and he can play again. But what if that one play is the one play that determines whether or not the team wins or loses? What if that is the one play? So it's, it's a prerequisite. This helmet is, is not optional, it's a requirement. If anything is to be done for the Lord and his kingdom, we must wear this helmet. We must put on the mind of Christ. We must suit up with all of the armor. It has to be pulled in tight and the helmet has to be worn. You can't survive without it. You'll lose the battle without it. I don't know of anybody <clears throat> that's ever played any kind of sport that requires a helmet or worked on a job that requires a hard hat that they went out without that hard hat that they didn't suffer the consequences, get scolded about it, or at the very least put themselves at high risk because they failed to wear their helmet. Always an issue there. Number three. Number three, writing this down. It's the power of God in your life. This helmet of salvation is the power of God in your life. You know, for, for several years that I read this scripture and studied this scripture, I thought the helmet of salvation was the act of salvation. The helmet of salvation is not the act of salvation. The helmet of salvation is something that will keep you thinking and being mindful of the one that saved you. That's what it's about. And without this helmet, we render ourselves powerless. If we don't have this helmet, if we don't put the helmet on with all the other armor, we are rendering ourselves powerless. Listen carefully. If the content of the mind isn't protected, the rest of the body fails. If the content of the mind is not protected, the rest of the body fails, which means if the mind isn't working correctly, and I know what you're thinking. I know some people right now in my family, they ain't been wearing their helmet, all right? But listen, if the mind isn't working correctly, the body, the body can't properly use the remaining parts of the armor. If, if the head isn't working, if the brain isn't working, then the brain can't tell the arm where to pick that shield up or how to put those shoes on or how to lace up the breastplate of God's righteousness. The, the, the mind has got to be centered on who Christ is and what he is in your life. Your mind's gotta be there. If, if the mind isn't working correctly, the rest of the body will fail. For an example, I've been to the hospitals before and I've looked at people that were, that were in ICU or CCU rooms. They had all the, the tubes and the machines hooked to them. Their body literally looked healthy. They, their hands were the same size. Their body was the same size. I saw them, I looked at them, I stood there, I prayed for them, I prayed with the family. But the doctor came in with the dreaded news that said everything else is intact but unfortunately, there's no brain waves, so they declared this person to be brain dead. That one diagnosis of being brain dead cancels the use of the entire body. It zeroes out the entire body. If the mind isn't right, if the mind isn't taken where it's supposed to be, if the, if the brain is not protected, the body can't be used anymore. And while physically that's tragic, it's even worse when it's a spiritual brain dead person. 
When you're spiritually brain dead, the rest of your body, the rest of your spirit person can't operate like it ought to. First Corinthians chapter two, verse four and five says, my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Well, how do I get this power? You know, preacher, you're telling me about this stuff. I like the idea and, and I agree with you and I've said amen and I've thought, man, that's positive and I, I want positive in my life. How, how do I get this power? This power? I wanna tell you how it's produced. It's not a magic potion that falls out of the sky. It's not a magic trick that somebody comes along and just brings this, this special dust and puts it on you or, or gets you in a back room and teaches you some spiritual words or whatever and teaches you to do this. Listen, it's produced. Anything that's produced has to start with something and it grows into something else. A movie producer gets an idea, he takes that and before it's all done with, when he produces the movie, when it says on those slides, producer and it has a name by it, that guy took it from zero, a thought or a, a minor idea and he created an entire movie and finished it. So this is not something that just falls in your lap. This power is something that you grow to know, something you grow with, something that grows inside of you. It's produced by spending time in prayer and spending time in God's word. I heard some skirt. Listen, it is produced. It is only produced. You cannot, listen to me, you cannot show up for church on Sunday morning, come to church on Wednesday night, tithe, help every department there is, volunteer for every activity that comes along, give in offerings, say amen, lift your hands, do anything else that involves coming to church. You can't do all of that and expect the power of God just to show up in your life. You have to spend time outside these four walls, away from the body of the believers when we get together to worship together. You have to get up on Monday morning and infiltrate the word of God into your life. You have to get up on Tuesday and you have to pray and you have to seek the face of God. I'm not talking about that you walk around like some weird old zombie. You're on your job and you're, you're just so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good and, and you just walk Walk around being so spiritual. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about if you want to enjoy the power of God through the working of the helmet of salvation, put that thing on and you'll experience that power through prayer and reading God's word. Prayer is having a relational conversation with God. That's what prayer is. We, we make prayer so difficult sometimes. Well, how about say the blessing? I, 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 I. Kids do it. Little Johnny say the prayer. I, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not beating you up, but listen. Men, how many of you right now, if we got through with church and I said, brother so-and-so, stand and dismiss us in prayer you would get, your, your nerves would get shot, your heart would beat, you'd just about look like you're going into labor pains. I mean, kidney stones moving or something. You'd about fall out, am I right? I'm not gonna call on you, don't worry. Everybody's like, I ain't saying nothing. Lights are down, he may not think I'm here. I'm not gonna do that to you. But it's the truth. If you were in a, in a position in your job and they were having a meal together and they called on you, men or women, and they said, would, would you ask the blessing? I understand you go to church to Life Point every Sunday morning and every Wednesday night and I understand you go there faithfully. So we want you to pray. How many times would you turn them down or would you get so flustered it would be easier and less embarrassing to fake that you're fainting so they had to call the ambulance to get you out of the room, right? How many times has people ever looked at you and said, does the Bible say anything about 
and whatever the case may be, that you had to look and say, let me call Pastor Bud and ask him. Let me text him where this is at or where that is. Pastor Bud, do you, does the Bible say anything about You know what that's a fault from? It's not a fault from the preaching that a pastor's doing. It's not a fault from the fact that God wants to move in your life. It's a fact you're not praying and having a relational conversation with God or studying God's word. Colossians chapter four, verse two says, continue in prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. God's word is his message to us. You, we got boxes and I, I got a drawer and we got boxes where you can open up these, these containers and look at them and these cards in there that my wife and kids have given me from way back. My, my kids would say, you're the greatest dad in the world. And they still believe that. Don't you? Don't you? Okay then, let's get that straight right now. And I go back and read it and, and some of their handwriting is all, my wife would, she, I can't tell you all that. But anyhow, she, uh, she gives me cards. <laughs> my wife's going, hush. And you know why I save them? Because they're, they're messages of love to me. I, I want one day, if, if the Lord tarries his coming, I want one day for my children, my grandchildren, to go back and look at this and say, man, look, look, how, look how my mom and daddy romanced each other. Y'all looking at me like you ain't never kissed nobody. You ain't never got a like letter or a love letter. I remember my first letter that said, I like you, do you like me? Check yes or no. Y'all remember that? Now we own something. Some of y'all ain't been getting cards, but now we own something. And the first one a girl said yes to, I held on to that letter. I mean, I ain't got it no more, just letting you know, baby, I ain't got it no more. <laughs> Throw that mug away in 1985. Cause we started dating in 85. Right. Woo-hoo. And so I was excited about that letter because it was a positive letter to me. Let me tell you something. God's word is his love letter to us. It's his message to us, telling us this is way, the way I want it to go. This is how I've called you to be. This is how I'm going to love you and I'm going to protect you and I'm going to show you. I'm going to teach you how to fight battles. I'm going to show you how to grow so you can wear the right armor. I'm going to take you to a place called Calvary where your sins can be forgiven and your sins can be washed away. This is my love letter to you. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And I love this scripture because it, it just kind of pulls everything back together for me. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong. Boy, we don't like that, do we? It corrects us when we're wrong. Mm, boy, I could preach right there. And it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. James chapter one, verse five says, if you need wisdom, ask, gener ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. And listen, now, now that we know about, that's about the helmet. We know about the helmet. Let me just touch one spot about using this helmet of God's salvation. The battle, listen very carefully, the battle will be lost if champions for God are not equipped with the right armor and their minds set on victory. The battle will be lost if champions of God don't put on this helmet and do what's right. People ask me all the time, man, what in the world has our world come to? What in the world is going on with this country? I can tell you, and I'm gonna say it again in just a minute. A lot of people took that helmet off a long time ago or never put it back on and tried to raise kids without it. Tried to have a good marriage without it. 
tried to pastor a church without it, tried to sing and without it, tried to talk about being a Christian and fighting all these battles without the helmet of salvation. I gotta move on before somebody gets mad. But it's gonna be lost if we don't get this helmet back on. You put all the other armor on if you want to and somebody hits you in the head, you're done. You're done. So defensive measures have to be taken. Defensive measures. You mean as Christians, we're on the defense? We are now. Because we took off the armor and the helmet, we took all this stuff off and we've laid it down and we've said, we don't wanna, we don't wanna do that. And now, now instead of being on the offense, we're on the defense. We're having to defend ourselves. Look around. Most of this world, much of this world hates everything there is about Christ and Christians. There's, a, there's an organization called Voice of the Martyrs. Y'all go check it out. There's Christians literally being killed by the hundreds every day on the other side of this globe. And they are quickly marching this direction to try to do it here. Much of this world hates what the Bible tells us and they hate it because it tells us how we should live and how we should behave and how we should believe. And they hate it. They hate it because nobody wants correction. Nobody likes correction. We'll say that again. Nobody likes correction. Try on this side. Nobody likes correction. I don't like it. Listen, I got two badges, law enforcement badges in my truck, legitimate real badges that they gave me. I didn't steal them or buy them on eBay or nothing. I got one with the, with the Sheriff's Department and I got one with the Georgia State Patrol. And any time, any time, any time, blue lights come up behind me, I start sweating. Knowing good and well, there's a 99% chance that I not only know them, I'm friends with them. But I, and I got both of these badges that I, I could use, I could say, hey, I, man, <laughs> and I do. <laughs> and you don't need me stand up here lying, I'm trying to preach Jesus to you. I ain't gonna lie and preach Jesus. But I still get upset, I still get nervous about it. You wanna know why? Because I don't like correction. I don't like correction. When, you, when you're raising your children, they don't like correction. When, when, a, when a superior on your job brings you in and says, hey, we need to have this talk and we need to change that, we get defensive, we don't like correction, we don't want correction. But that's what the Word of God does. It shows us direction and it gives us correction. There was a politician not too long ago that said, and if I called his name, you'd know exactly who I'm talking about. But he said this, it's time to take this country back from the churchgoers. It's time to take this country back from the churchgoers. As if we've taken the country and ruined it and they're gonna straighten it out while they continue to kick God out of everything. And Christians have allowed them to do it. When Madeleine O'Hare, I wasn't even planning on telling you this, but when Madeleine O'Hare went before the Supreme Court to have a, a Bibles and, and prayer taken out of our schools all over this country, there was not one organization, not one Christian organization, not one preacher, not one Christian, nobody stood in opposition, nobody. We're living in a day when supposed Christians, people that are supposed to be Christians, Bible-believing Christians will defend the open killing of unborn babies up to the point of birth. You, you hear that baby crying, can you imagine taking that baby and taking its life right now? We have Christian people in, we, no we don't, that's not true. We have people that use the word Christian that are defending that kind of activity in this country. Did you know a few years back, nearly 80% of the residents of two states, Louisiana and the state of California Nearly 80% of the residents voted to ban gay marriage 
But one liberal judge overturned the will of the people. 80% of the people. Why? Why did this happen? Why is this going on? Why are we facing this stuff? I want to tell you why. Because somewhere in our history, Christians have removed the helmet of God's salvation and said, I want everything else, but I don't want that. I don't want my mind changed. I don't want my heart challenged. I'm not gonna pray. I'm not gonna read the word of God. And if I do, I'm not gonna listen to what it tells me. And by doing so, their minds have become a cesspool of hatred towards the one and only true God. It's become a cesspool. Have you ever noticed, whether it's a football player or a farmer that's working out in the field, they've got something on their head and they get hot and they get tired. I've never seen one, one football player come off the line or come off the field, I'm sorry, come off the field and go sit down and take his shoes off and rub his feet. I said, man, my feet's tired. I, I've never seen anybody that wears a hat come in and they're hot and they're tired but they don't take that hat off first. Every time that there's somebody that's got a helmet of some sort that's protecting their head and it's on their body and they're hot and they're tired, that's the first thing they take off. And I want to tell you something. God's church is doing the same thing. And God knows we get tired and God knows the battle is tough and God knows the battle is hard. But we got to keep the helmet on we got to keep wearing the helmet of salvation. we got to keep protecting our head. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. You know what that means? I'm begging you. I'm pleading. I'm begging you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Listen, listen to this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Listen to me this morning, church. Listen carefully. Without the helmet of salvation, we can't defend our mind against the attack of the enemy. We gotta wear the helmet of salvation.